Very good. Well, I hope everybody's enjoying the, well, I guess it's somewhat unpredictable weather, but um, it certainly feels from a heat perspective, it's it's starting to feel like summer. So yes, yeah, so um, thank you very much for having me. I enjoy talking about uh, history, whether it's in person or now via Zoom. And uh, I also especially love talking about the, the story of the General Slocum. Uh, this June, so just a few weeks ago, uh, June 15th was uh, I can't remember what anniversary, the 119th anniversary of the tragedy, but also for me, the 20th anniversary, which is hard to believe, of when I first published uh, my book. The uh, book came out in 2000, 2003, and then the paperback came out in 2004 for the 100th anniversary. So, you know, time time flies along. So what we'll do um, in this talk is I will uh, start out by sort of sketching the background. Who you know? Who are these people? What's going on uh, that that gets them on this boat in the spring of 1904? And then walk us through the various phases of the tragedy, uh, and then and then the aftermath, and then the, sort of the long aftermath uh, as well. So uh, and then we'll have some time for uh, for some questions. So let the the way to begin with this is you know the General St Slocum fire is very much a fire connected to a particular neighborhood. So hang on here. Yep. So uh, the community, most of the people on this steamboat uh, were German immigrants and German uh, Americans from the Little Germany neighborhood um, in New York City. So way back in the 19th century, you had lots of different neighbor ethnic neighborhoods, just like we still have them today. And uh, the two big ones in the mid 19th century were the, you can see there in the green, uh, those are the Little Ireland wards in lower Manhattan. And the ones in orange are the Little Germany wards. And you had lots of Irish people and other folks living in the German ward and uh, lots of Germans and others living in the Irish wards, but it's really the predominance of one in the other. And uh, so Little Germany starts to take form in the 1840s along with Little Ireland. And, you know, by the 1880s, 1890s, there's tens of thousands of German folks there. And they make it into a full-blown community, just like if you were to walk through Chinatown uh, today or any other kind of ethnic enclave. So this map that you see here, uh, all of those dots, this comes from a history of Little Germany, each of those dots represents an institution. So each, you know, there's probably, of, among those dots, probably a couple of synagogues, many churches, a you know German newspaper, uh, a you know libraries, and when I say German newspaper in the German language, uh, German German labor halls, German theaters where productions are in the German language, um, all the kinds of things that one would find in an ethnic neighborhood because it's really really hard to be an immigrant. So you create these neighborhoods where you can have friends and family and contacts. You can share, you know, speak your shared language while you learn English. And uh, you can also take advantage of, you know, or, or at least the psychological advantage of, you know, going to see some music performed in your language or some theater performed in your language. So Little Germany is one of these thriving uh, ethnic communities. And one of the institutions in that was, among many churches and a few synagogues, uh, was St. Mark's Lutheran Church on East 6th Street. And that church uh, today is still there, although it's, you know, it's been turned into many, many things. In fact, it became a synagogue uh, in the mid 20th century. So like a lot of religious sites in New York, they continuously are, are recycled. And so St. Mark's dates back to the 1850s. Um, and it is, by the 1880s, um, it's a thriving Lutheran parish, and it gets a young minister named George Haas. So he becomes the minister in the 1880s. And he's right out of uh, seminary, and he's really the community leader, the leader of the parish, um, and a very much beloved uh, figure. And he's the guy that that back in the you know I think it was in the eight, late 1880s. He's the one who design, devised or came up with the idea that we should have an end of the year party. We should have a big end of the year picnic uh, to celebrate the end of the school year, the Sunday school year, and the beginning of summer. So. By 1904, this little picnic in the park has become a much, much bigger deal. And you can see this is the cover of the program. And I've held this program uh, in my hands, kind of a fun, a cool thing about being a historian. I think it's about 20 pages long. So it's really almost like a small magazine. And it's the full program for the day. All the things are going to happen, all the uh, food that's available, all the music that's going to happen, all the competitions that are going to take place, and then just tons of ads, lots of little little ads that local German-American businesses took out um, to support the outing, to support the, the, uh, 
um, you know, the, the, the church. And so this is going to be the 17th one. It's going to be the biggest one ever. And they have their plan is to take a steamboat from lower Manhattan and go up the East River and then out into Long Island Sound and out there at, at a place called Locust Park, which I think there is a place still called Locust Park. At, the, at, at that time, it was a picnic area. So it had a big long pier and, uh, you know, kind of a clubhouse and a place for food and a little bit of a beach and ball fields and things. So it was a great place to kind of get out. So part of the fun was the boat ride itself. And then the most of the fun was all day in the sun and in, you know, in, uh, just hanging out by the seashore and enjoying you know, food and beer and music and all of that. So that was the destination, which they, in this case, never got to. Yeah, and you can see, remind ourselves that in 1904, most Americans, certainly immigrants uh, living in cities, do not know how to swim. And so we're we're becoming a society that likes to go to the beach, but look at how heavily dressed everybody is. It's a very different world. You wore your Sunday best to the beach and you rolled up your pant legs and you might've hiked up your dress a little bit, but very few people would actually get fully bodily into the water. Kids might do it, uh, but even then they'd be pretty well heavily clothed. Um, and that's gonna play a role in our in the experience. So that's the community. And that's what the, the big event is that they think is gonna be the best day of their lives. They've got a really cool boat uh, to take them there, the General Slocum. The General Slocum, when it was first unveiled in 1891, was uh, one of the most, you know, it was considered really the finest steamboat in New York Harbor, in the New York waterways. By 1904, that's 13 years later, it's still quite fine, but it's not really, it's, there are other boats that have surpassed it, but it's still a pretty big deal for these mostly working class people to be able to get onto this fancy, gleaming white steamboat with two paddle wheels and lots of open deck. You can see it's uh, going to be a great, you know, experience to the journey itself is half the fun. This is not a picture of the event, but this is exactly what it would have looked like. You can see all the people on the right-hand side going onto the vessel. 264 feet in length, capacity, not by our standards, but by 1890 standards, was 2,400. And this is what it would have looked like. This is, again, from a different, you know, from a couple of years beforehand at some, like maybe 4th of July or some other event. But that's what this would, the vessel would have looked like on Mar June 15th, 1904, jammed with families, um, you know, probably almost 2,000 people on, on board the vessel and lots and lots of women, lots of children. Uh, most, many families, it was just the mothers and the children because it was the middle of the week and a lot of fathers were still, had to work. So it was really kind of a, a heavily, predominantly women, children and uh, older folks. All right, so what the day that, that uh, what the day of the event is a spectacular day in terms of uh, in terms of weather. It you know it looks like this. It's a bright bright blue sky, middle of June. It's warm. It's breezy. Everybody's big fear, of course, leading up to it was that it was going to rain. And of course, now it turns out it's just like this absolutely picture perfect day. And so the Slocum is you know picks up everybody on East Third Street, way down the lower end of the island and begins to chug its way up the East River. It's a work day, so the East River is filled with lots of boats of every different size, working boats, cargo boats, tugboats, et cetera. And on probably while it's picking up passengers, a small fire has started in, if you look in the lower left-hand side of this image, you can see a storage room where there's a little bit of orange flame. And that is where the fire begins. So it's about 10 minutes up the river that a young boy comes to a deckhand and says, mister, there's smoke coming up the stairs. And so the deckhand goes down those stairs and sees a storage room with smoke coming out from, an, you know, out from the door. He yanks, he does what you shouldn't do. He yanks open the door and doesn't realize this, uh, but is gonna give it a big boost of oxygen. And it was really what appeared to be a smoldering fire. So a lot of, there's a lot of hay on the ground, which was used for packing items. There's charcoal, there's oil, there's oily rags. It's a real, you know, and there's, you know, because it's, in fact, I think it's called the lantern room. So it's filled with all kinds of stuff that are, that is very flammable. But at the time that he goes down there, it's kind of just smoldering. But when he yanks open that door, suddenly it gets a big rush of oxygen and the fire really gets going. He doesn't know what to do. He tries to, you know, put it out. Can't, he doesn't succeed. And he runs to go find help and he leaves the door open. So the disaster is really underway at that moment. One crucial detail is that this, this uh, storage room has vents. So 
high vents coming in from the bow. So as this boat is moving at you know, 12, 13, 14 knots up the East River, air is pouring into those vents and pouring into this room. So you know, it's a fire that is going to get sort of a supercharge of oxygen. It's also at the base of the stairwell, which itself will be kind of like a chimney. You know, each it goes all the way to the top deck. And you can see within just a, a moment, the fire, when he runs to go get help, the fire goes out of the storage room, goes up the stairs, continues to go uh, up the stairs. And that's really where when people start to realize there's a fire, it's, there's a great big ball of fire pouring out of the port side, the left-hand side of the vessel. And it all started right there in that forward position. Starting in the forward position is also going to make it uh, that much more perilous because this is a boat that's moving. So the fire is going to, you know, you can see three quarters of the deck is behind the fire. So the fire is going to move in, in that direction. You know, that what they teach you in grade school, when you, if you ever catch fire, stop, drop and roll, because if you run, you're going to fan the flames. Well, that, this is essentially what's happening here. The, the vessel's movement is going to be fanning the flames and fanning them backwards onto all the people that have, tr you know, are trying to get back to the, the rear end of the, uh, the stern of the ship to get away from it. All right, so the, the vessel is made out of wood. It has been painted every season. So it's painted with layer upon layer of highly flammable uh, paints, paints that we would never use uh, today. And very quickly, and these are scenes drawn by um, newspaper artists based on vivid descriptions that uh, survivors gave to them. And you can see mothers with, and there are many stories of mothers with like four, five, six kids. And having to you know gather them up as best they can and and flee the flames, you can also see that man there is pull, trying to pull down life preservers, and that's going to be one of the sub stories to this, which is that all kinds of things are, you know, compromised and uh, safety measures ignored, etc. And all the incredibly high death toll, over a thousand, are, are going to die on this in this morning. Uh, and a lot of it is due to safety violations and safety negligence. And here's another one of these drawings. You can see the the great bulk of the fires there in that forward position uh, on the port side. And you can see people just pouring over the over the railings. Most of the th thousand plus people who die this in this incident are going to die of drowning. Uh, so the fire will kill some people, smoke will kill some people, but the great majority, probably 900 or so, uh, die simply by, you know, falling in, jumping into the East River. And let's circle back to that earlier photo. They are wearing their absolute Sunday best, you know, wool suits, heavy multi-layer dresses, boots, uh, you know, and they don't know how to swim. So if you don't know how to swim and you jump into the river wearing that much clothing, you have maybe 60 seconds, maybe 70 seconds, if you're lucky, before you go under. You just simply, there's no way to, uh, to stay afloat. And the problem is that some people did get their hands on life preservers, but you can see these, now the, this is a, a photo of evidence from the hearing the investigation afterward. And you can see that these life preservers were put on board the vessel in 1891 and basically left over, you know, season after season after season in the salt air, in the extremes of heat, et cetera. And they were, many of them were completely rotten, uh, rotten, the, the external canvas on the outside, but also in those days, what made a life preserver float was blocks of cork. And over 13 seasons in the sun, uh, the, the, in the cold, those blocks of cork had disintegrated. So they had no buoyancy whatsoever. In fact, if you put a life preserver like that over your over your body and strapped yourself in and jumped off the off a boat, it was like jumping off a boat with a two sacks of flour around your neck. You know, gonna they're gonna absorb all the water and actually pull you to the bottom, do the very opposite thing that they were designed to do. And that happens for many, many folks. Um, people considering themselves lucky for having gotten their hands on a life preserver, putting it on their children, putting it on themselves, jumping overboard and sinking like stones. And there are lots of eyewitness accounts uh, about that. And also in the aftermath, bodies recovered uh, from the East River with uh, life preservers completely soaked, completely uh, useless. Yeah, and you can see most of the people are, are pouring over the side. Um, you know, it's, it's a real horrible choice that a lot of people have to make. Um, nobody wants to die by fire, but also jumping in the river has to be about as terrifying a thing as one could imagine, even if you know how to swim. And most of these folks don't know how to swim. You can see here's a description from uh, an eyewitness who looked out. He had an east view of the East River, and he looked out and he saw this 
bizarre, horrible scene of this vessel, you know, moving at great speed up the East River, almost completely engulfed in, in fire. And he knew a friend at the uh, at the newspaper, at the New York World, and he dialed up the New York World and dictated this message to the reporter. I'm in an office overlooking the East River. And this is almost kind of, you can imagine, this is sort of like the, the guy describing the Hindenburg, you know, uh, can't believe what he's actually seeing. There's a steamboat on fire, a side wheeler. I can see women and children running around on her decks. Smoke is rolling up. Oh God, women and children are leaping over the railing by the dozens. The ship is veering towards the shore, towards the Bronx, around 135th Street. Now it's turning away, speeding up river, heading for the North, North Brother Island. The whole thing is a floating furnace. This is ghastly and horrible. And then he just hangs, hangs up the phone. Uh, so you can imagine what it would have looked like. Also, there's just thousands and thousands of witnesses to this because it's a work day. So the East River is one of the busiest rivers uh, and waterfronts uh, in the world. All right. So the captain of the General Slocum is one, perhaps the most experienced captain. So he's and he has an almost impeccable safety record. In fact, uh, the year before he was awarded from the Society of Ship Captains or whatever, some sort of organization he belonged to. He was awarded a kind of a lifetime achievement award. He's 70 years old at this point. He was awarded a medal for his exemplary um, service and the fact that he had never lost a life in in 50 something years of, of uh, work. So he seems like the ideal guy for a catastrophe like this. He, you know, he would figure out what to do to mitigate the damage, to mitigate the loss of life. Um, but he does, he does the wrong thing. So if you've ever been on the East River, um, it's, it's really narrow. It's very, you look to your left, look to your right, and you can see you know, pier after pier after pier, docking area for uh, vessels of every size. And so you would think that one option would be to just simply, you know, pull the board into the boat, pull the slocum up to one of these piers and just let everybody pile off off the vessel. He considers that. Then he says later, I thought, you know, it might catch fire on, you know, it might set off some explosions of, of oil tanks. And he had some image in his mind that it might have been a, a worse catastrophe. His other option is to stop dead in the water. So, and you know, the old, stop, the, the nautical version of stop, drop and roll, you just stop the vessel. Uh, that would slow the progress of the fire backward. And it would also allow, there were dozens and dozens of boats that were now in pursuit of the slocum, picking people out of the water and some pretty good sized tugboats as well that could have pulled alongside and taken people off. Uh, but he decides that's not the best decision. The best decision in his mind is to open the throttle and go full throttle uh, for another seven, eight minutes up the East River to North Brother Island, which is a small island right off of the Bronx. And he he has two thoughts in mind. One is there's a hospital on that island, so he'll, there'll be medical folks there that can help out. And two, he knows the area so well, he says there's a beach there. You know, There's a kind of a little cove uh, on North Brother Island, and I think I could get the vessel in and swing it towards the beach and kind of unch it up against the, you know, the, the shore, and it'll be in about five feet of water, and people can jump off the vessel and, you know, and walk to shore. Well, you know, that long period of getting to North Brother Island, the flames are just, you know, getting bigger and bigger, more and more deadly, and more and more people are pouring over the sides of, uh, of the vessel, and that's what that man was describing. They do eventually get uh, to North Brother Island. So here you can see the map of the East River. And if you just follow the black lines there, you can see uh, the, the, the journey of the General Slocum. And up there in the upper right, you can see uh, North Brother Island. And there's a little indicator as to where it, where the vessel lands. Yeah, so that's his goal. Unfortunately, the vessel catches some ground and it stops near the beach, but it's about in about 12, 13 feet of water, which is, if you don't know how to swim, that's like 1300 feet of water. It, you're, you're over your head. So you could survive that harrowing journey all the way to North Brother Island, finally get to North Brother Island, jump overboard uh, and drown. So a kind of a many tragedies rolled into, into one here. He eventually gets there. People do pour over the sides. People from the hospital come out and, and help. They get into rowboats. There's, a, there's construction taking place at the hospital. So some people take these big, long wooden ladders and lay them in the water and they don't know how to swim, but they walk out to their chest and then they extend the ladders out to, to people flailing in the water and they pull them in. So a lot of folks, you know, end up surviving and, you know, coming ashore at North Brother Island, but the great majority of folks uh, do not. And this is what the Slocum looked like a couple hours later, where it was still burning as the tide came in and eventually enveloped it. So there's a rescue period 
uh, that is only a few, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, if you don't, you, most people drown within 60 to 90 seconds if they don't know how to swim. And if you add to that, holding on to children um, and also being very heavily clothed, it's an even, it's an even faster process. So the rescuing is over in a matter of minutes. I mean, some people manage to cling to bits of wood. They, they cling to the other people, um, but they, for the most part, there's very little rescuing to be done. And this is what these young uh, men are doing there. That What they're approaching is a big tangle of people tangled up in netting, uh, probably from the railings that where they you know, crashed through the railings uh, to, to get off, get away from the flames and kind of went down in a tangle of wood and, and uh, netting. Pretty, pretty gruesome scenes. And you can see they begin to pluck people out more and more rescue, uh, you know, fire, fire department tugs and that sort of thing descend upon the scene. And a lot of people are brought to shore or simply float up on shore on, on North Brother Island. And again, you can see here, they look like they stepped out of a church, right? They're in full wool finery, uh, almost impossible for, for them to have stayed afloat for very long. And in the background, you can see people rowing around looking for uh, more and more victims. Another shot of victims. This is North Brother Island. You can also see one of the ladders that I mentioned that people used, quick quick thinking people used to push out into the water and pull people uh, pull people in. There's an incredible stories, and I document these all in the book, incredible stories of rescues that people uh, pull off, including people that don't know how to swim. They sort of just you know, get out, they they go out over their heads and with sort of strategic flailing, they manage to grab, a, you know, two-year-olds and three-year-olds and and pull them in. Um, very rare, but I mean, certainly they're, they're notable. Um, and you can see the people in, the women in white are nurses from the, the hospital that was located on the island. And here's a much bigger scene. I always note that this scene looks very, almost calm, um, but this is probably a, a scene of absolutely, you know, just sobbing and screaming and crying and people looking for their for their loved ones because it's complete chaos. Um, one of the things that contributed to the chaos was the security that people felt when they were on the boat because the boat is basically fully enclosed and it's got a railing all the way around and it felt very secure to a lot of these folks. So they, you know, a lot of families did the, did you know did the following. They sort of found a good spot set up their little, you know, their, their picnic, you know, their all their you know, blankets and picnic uh, baskets and things. And they said to the kids, go, you know, go have fun, go, go run around the decks for a little while. And then suddenly somebody smells smoke. And then suddenly realize the, the vessel is on fire and people don't know where uh, the children are. And that's a story I'll tell in just a moment when I get to one of the, um, one of the people that the families that I, that I tracked. Yep. The, the, the personnel begin to show up to and the destination for all these victims is the lo is the city morgue, uh, which is considerable ways downtown. And you can see the policemen in the old fashioned uh, helmets. The city actually runs out of coffins for about a day. Then they have to be, b hire a whole bunch of carpenters and begin to build coffins 24 seven at North Brother Island. I mean, cause you have eventually over a thousand um, people um, die in this tragedy. The city of New York in 1904 has about 20 English language newspapers. That's just the English language newspapers. And there's scores of other kind of uh, publications. And so this is the advent, you know, the era of where there are telephones, there's kind of instant com communication, and the, the, the press gets there very quickly. And you can see right in the center, there's somebody with a bandage on their head, and they are telling their story to a group of uh, seven or eight uh, reporters. And this is gonna be a story covered very quickly in New York and then of course around the nation and even worldwide. And this is also the era in which newspapers would put out extras. They would just continuously crank out editions uh, based on new information. And you know the early prediction here from the New York Journal is that 300 or not a prediction, but sort of a um, 325 lost, at least 600 lost on General Slocum. And then a few hours later, the New York World is the first to report that the death toll is probably going to go north of 1,000. And it's and they this is the dominant story um, in the city, dominant in many ways across the country. I've got newspapers from Buffalo and Helena, Montana, and elsewhere that uh, with full blown coverage. And so pretty quickly, the story you know shifts from uh, the, the the tragedy itself to recovering bodies, but to the families that are left behind. So lots and lots of people in little Germany 
uh, are at their jobs. They're working in their delis, they're working in their laundries, they're working, uh, doing their jobs. And people are rushing in to say, did you hear, did you hear? Um, the boat, the boat caught fire and lots of people have died. You know, and then, So what do you do if you're a husband or a brother or somebody related to these folks and you know your, your wife and six children are on, on board this vessel, you know, you run to the police station, you run to the church, you run. And so this is what, uh, and you also run to find other, other folks. Pretty quickly, they set up a command center uh, at the church. And this is what you're looking at here. They're trying to tabulate the names of people who are on board and also the names of people that are uh, still missing and the growing numbers of people that are um, identified. This is the outside of the church. Hundreds of people are outside. And you can see there's a policeman checking people as they go in. They want to make sure that only actual family members, not thrill seekers, are um, going in to snoop around. So the morgue for New York City is too small. It can't handle this volume. So they go next door to a, it looks like an you know a aircraft hangar, but it's a basically a big, an enclosed pier. And they set up the, the coffins in three rows. And they, in those days, you filled coffins with ice. There was the only way to preserve um, the, the deceased. And that's why the floor is all wet. And if you've seen any images of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, which took place seven years later, they did the exact same thing. This is, so they, th this scene looks a lot like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire scene where they set everybody up, all the deceased up and let uh, friends and family you know, make snake their way through the coffins to take a look and see if they could identify someone. A pretty grim and terrible scene you could imagine. You know, people walking through, on the one hand, sort of hoping to find their loved ones, but also hoping not to find their uh, loved ones because if they find them, that means they're gone. Thousands and thousands of people line up outside, waiting, waiting, waiting to get you know the chance to go inside and to see if they can find somebody. And you can see the anxiety. Um, on the faces of these folks, not a good, not a good situation. And again, another shot from from inside. And again, this is also a, a shot that looks fairly placid. People sort of milling about, but you can imagine it's just filled with sorrow and filled with cries of anguish and um, people fainting. Vivid descriptions of how just really terrible and intense it was. Around back of the morgue uh, are the, these are hearses all lined up from various funeral. Uh, companies. Many funeral directors did the right thing, were wonderful and helpful and caring to the people. There were stories of people that gouged folks, took advantage and, you know, charged triple for the funerals. Um, I document that in the book as well. Um, much of this story is a sort of story of, of heroism and horror, right? Really humanity at its worst or life at its worst and also life and people um, at their best. And it, it, it's, it's everywhere, right down to the conduct of funeral directors. The city of New York has only on rare occasion uh, put flags at half staff and put black bunting on City Hall. And this was one of those occasions. The, the previous time was when General when uh, President Grant died. And the previous time to that was when Lincoln died. So it's Lincoln, Grant, and the General Slocum fire. The funeral. So this is in an era when funerals took place relatively uh, quickly. The volume of death is so great that the People in the Saint in the Little Germany neighborhood realize they can't do full blown church and synagogue uh, funerals, so they they kind of get the the ministers and the rabbis get together and they say, look, let's just do all at home funerals, and we'll just do them as quickly, we'll do them you know respectfully, but as quickly as we can, and so there are no funerals taking place in any of the churches and synagogues in the neighborhood. They're all being done, you know, in kind of succession uh, in the tenements of of Little Germany. And here's a map again um, showing this is a this is I think it says the th this is a map that refers to the death district. So this is a subsection of the sort of St. Mark's neighborhood in uh, Little Germany, and each dot represents a, a, a tenement where somebody has died. More than one person has died. So it's a uh, as somebody said, it's a concentrated tragedy. So people die from Harlem. People die from uh, you know, Hoboken from Brooklyn, but the great, great, great majority are from this one concentrated couple square miles uh, in lower Manhattan. There are so many funerals taking place, but the one that sort of becomes the representative funeral for the whole community is for Reverend Haas's family. So Reverend Haas heroically survives the fire. He gets badly, badly burned. Um, he, you know, tries to close doors, you know, as the flames are bearing down on people. Um, he eventually gets to the 
stern of the vessel hangs over the side with uh, his family. And what happened to him happened to many people, which is like, they feel like they're going to be able to ride this thing out. And uh, along comes 30 completely panicked people uh, running away from flames and they just run right through them, you know, crash through the, ra the railing and take everybody into the river. And that's what happened to Reverend Haas. He lost his wife, his daughter, his sister, uh, several other members of the extended family. And this is the funeral of his wife. So he is badly burned. He's in a state of shock and he insists, and he, he's right there in the, having just come down the bottom, come just come off the stairs. And this is the hearse that is bearing um, his family members. And he's going to, he, the funeral has just make, taken place in the home and they are going to now head out to Queens where the church has a plot for where they're going to bury uh, the dead. So thousands of people sort of watch this funeral. You can see people in windows, people are up on roofs. So his suffering, his loss is sort of representative of the of the whole community. Yep, there he is, um, the two men at the bottom of the stairs. He's the one on the left. And, you know, this is Grand Street, right? The smack in the middle of the Lower East Side. And it's where the procession points. So at the end of Grand Street are ferries that take you to Queens or to Brooklyn. And so that's where all, wherever the funerals are taking place, they end up onto Grand Street heading towards uh, the East River. And you can see this, these are hearses in the middle of these crowds. And these are people from all over New York. And they're throwing, you know, laying flowers down in front of the hearses. White hearses are for children. Black hearses are uh, for adults. Tradition would have it that you would have never have more than one casket in a, in a, um, a hearse, but in this case, many of these these hearses have two and three and four caskets again because of the volume uh, of the tragedy. And here are some of these same hearses now out in Middle Village, Queens, at the Lutheran Cemetery. Um, it's called All Faiths Cemetery right now. Uh, now it's um, and you can still go to see the uh, the great monument there. And so here is many families have plots, many families, so they're going to be buried in and around this area. But there are at this point about sixty one unidentified remains. Uh, and, and, you know, in those days, there's no DNA. Maybe there's some dental records. People are recognized by wedding rings and the usual things. But there are a lot of people that are unrecognizable, it's particularly those if you've been submerged for a number of days, a number of weeks, you're, it's really next to impossible to identify anybody. And so 60 something people are going to be buried in this mass grave. And that's on, on top of which they're going to put a beautiful uh, memorial. So hold that thought. So while this you know, tragedy is playing out, a lot of focus begins to immediately focus on, in the same way that the submersible disaster around the Titanic, you know, immediately people are simultaneously feeling sorry for the people that died, but also then saying, what the heck happened here? How did this, who did what? And of course, immediately we start to learn that the submersible was kind of not kind of thrown together. There was no regulation. They ignored all kinds of safety things. There were people that, you know, were fired for complaining about safety violations. All of that is true here in, uh, in 1904. And you can see the, uh, you know, in earlier generations in American history, a disaster like this might be treated as, quote, an act of God or just like a terrible tragedy. Not anymore. You can see the, uh, the, the emphasis is on culpability. This is not a natural disaster. This is not an act of God. This is an act of man, more specifically an act of greedy men who cut corners and didn't replace the life preservers, never trained the crew on board the ship to, uh, uh, you know, to, to know what to do in the midst of a, of a fire. Um, and you know, not I should have mentioned earlier, not only were the life preservers rotten, so were the fire hoses. So even half-hearted attempts to put out the fire uh, failed. Yeah, and this is another one, death and greed partners. And you can see the man at the foot of the of the uh, child is uh, to represent, in this case, Frank Barnaby. He's the, um, the the Ebenezer Scrooge kind of figure who owns the, the principal owner of the Knickerbocker Steamboat Company that owned the General Slocum, um, basically saying these children died because of his greed. So an investigation with, with a speed that would just astonish us today, it's just a matter of 10 days or so, and they're doing full-blown investigation into this, take, taking testimony under oath, et cetera. Um, first thing they do is they begin to inspect the wreck. And in those days, they do have a capability of getting into deep sea diving, um, you know, sending divers down to pull up um, evidence and to see, you know, also to find bodies that are trapped in, in the vessel. And th this these investigations are the, some of the first realized that most of the fire hoses were never deployed. Uh, there were, you know, any number of safety violations. And uh, that's going to really begin that 
that process of turning attention towards the, the owners of the vessel as the principal culprits. They eventually do raise the vessel uh, to the surface and pump out all the water. And you can see much of the, much of the top part of the boat is completely consumed by flames. The slocum will actually be sold at auction and this shell, the sort of lower hull, will be used as a barge for about 10 years. So it still has a life beyond the General Slocum tragedy and it will eventually sink um, in a hurricane, I think in 1914 to thereabouts. Yep, so they're salvaging it at this point but also looking, looking for bits of evidence. The coroner uh, in the, the borough of the Bronx, because the vessel landed at uh, North Brother Island, it was technically a Bronx event. And so the coroner in the Bronx convenes um, an investigation and begins to take, you know, invite everybody in. Many survivors show up at, the, at this uh, inquest. And this is a woman who lost all of her children. And she's telling her story to a, to a reporter. And you can see herself badly, badly burned. Here's Frank Barnaby um, testifying under oath about the condition of the vessels, whether they had new life preservers or not. I mean, he looks like a slippery character right out of central casting, if you ask me. And a lot of people saw him that way. His real business, he's a very wealthy man. His primary business is real estate. So hes this is a little side hustle for him, owning uh, the General Slocum and one other uh, vessel. Um, here's Henry Lundberg. So in those days, you did have you know, regulatory agencies. It was a steamboat inspection service, the forerunner to the Coast Guard. And this guy, Henry Lundberg, was the man who conducted the inspection of the Slocum and said it's A-OK -okay for the 1904 season uh, just a few weeks before the fire. Um, he had had basically no training. Uh, and he, when he did his inspection, by all accounts, he just kind of walked around and, you know, looked up at life preservers, didn't take any down, didn't count them, didn't check their condition, uh, didn't ask anybody to, you know, to, about their fire drills. And so it was a real cursory you know, look the other way, kind of. And, you know, in those days, everybody presumed that they got a $10 bill for making it a, you know, look the other way kind of inspection. We don't have any evidence of that, but it certainly would have been, you know, in keeping with that style of of uh, New York politics and New York society at the time. Um, and then this is the secretary um, under oath uh, answering questions, because at a certain point, people realized that the she's doctored the books. So she's the one with, who keeps the books for the company. And in, to make a long story short, there was there were receipts showing that they did buy about 500 new life preservers a year or two earlier, but they went to the other boat. They, this is a two boat company. They went to the Grand Republic, which is the other boat. But when the tragedy took place, she went and used sort of 1904 whiteout and changed the the, the you know doctored the bills the, the receipts to say that those 500 life preservers went to the General Slocum. And this was exposed right on the stand. Um, they had to admit that they had lied and that and they had tampered with evidence. And here's again, evidence of the really terrible condition of the um, of the life preservers, just, you know, rotten on the outside, rotten on the inside, to totally useless. The captain also has to answer for his decisions. He survives, he, he breaks his leg, jumping from the uh, vessel when it gets to North Brother Island. Um, and he, you know, is really one of those focal points along with the owners of the company. He refuses, though, I'll tell you, to just to, he refuses to, to implicate the company. He basically takes the bullet for the company. Um, not really sure why he does this, but he is not, he is among many people that are uh, indicted and, and charged with manslaughter and uh, dereliction of duty and, and several other things. And in the end, he is the only one that uh, is found guilty and he's given a 10 year sentence. Um, and he's 70 years old. This is maybe even a, you know, a death sentence. Um, and he doesn't waver. He says, nope, I did the, I did the right thing. The company, you know, uh, I can't think how he phrased it, but he basically said the company didn't do anything wrong. It was all my fault. Um, and it's not, not really clear why he took the bullet for the company because he certainly wasn't, wasn't really well paid or taken care of by them. So, um, the, the grief, you know, one of the things you want to get at as a historian is like, What's it like, you know, for these people? And these are mostly working class people, so they don't really keep diaries and, and you know, write essays about these things that we have to this day. But you have to, you know, can imagine what, what's a tragedy like, you know, and think about people who survive a mass shooting or a, um, a, a sinking of a vessel, like, you know, maybe even a smaller scale version of it or a house fire. You know, these are really terrible things. What's it like? And so I was lucky enough to find that the, youngest survivor of the General Slocum tragedy, he was six month old baby at the time, 
was 98 years old, still alive, still very active, very sharp, uh, living in New Jersey. And she had tons of stuff. And so with the stuff that she had was her dad. So she was on board with her two sisters and her parents. And her uh, two sisters were, were killed. One was never found. And her mother was burned on like 40% of her body, um, probably from hanging on the railing and holding the baby out over, over the river. And uh, the flames burned her on one side. Miraculously, the two of them ended up on North Brother Island. The father was also badly burned, searching for the children. Um, and he ended up dying just a few years later. And he was only about 30 years old. So no way to say that the tragedy killed him, but it certainly, that's the way the family always understood it. But in the years after it, were, he... Adela, here she is, a little baby. Now she's 18 months old because it's the one year anniversary of the tragedy. And by now funds have been collected and a beautiful monument has been built out there over the mass grave in the cemetery. And she is being the younger survivor. She's gonna get to pull the string to drop that American flag. You can see the third image there. Uh, the American flag will drop and it will reveal, reveal the uh, monument. And so she's in all the newspapers. And so her dad collects the newspapers and makes um, makes a scrapbook. And then, he, as she said, he just couldn't stop himself. Any bit of information that he got about the tragedy, any communications from lawyers, any further news in the, in the newspapers, any, you know, follow-up story about, you know, people involved with it, he cut it out and put it into the into this scrapbook. And I, I got to look through and to photograph uh, those, the, the scrapbook. So here's the monument. Um, and you can, if you don't, if you go out to the uh, cemetery today, if you go to the office and just say, where's the Slocum Memorial? They, they, it's the most famous thing in the, in the cemetery. They, they'll tell you exactly how to get there. There's a second monument, much less well-known, but in Tompkins Square Park, right in the middle of that little Germany neighborhood. Um, and it's in the park and it's sort of a monument to the children, hundreds of children that were lost uh, in the tragedy. It's been beautifully restored. It was basically much of the imagery and all the words had been kind of worn away over time, but about 10 years ago, it got, it was restored. So Paul Liebenau, this is Adela's dad, um, and you get a sense here, this is like one of those magical moments when you're looking at, you know, resource, you know, uh, documents. So he's got this one page in the, in the scrapbook where he's taken his receipt from the day before the tragedy. So if you look at the top, it says June 14th, 1904, Paul Liebenau, he goes to a haberdasher and gets uh, a, a new suit and a new hat. So this is a big deal, right? He's a bartender. He's not a rich man. He gets a new suit and a new hat because this is a big celebration, you know, et cetera. And then um, the next day, yeah. And so $16, again, a lot of money. And notice he's written at the bottom of the receipt before June 15th, 1904. So this is the happy anticipatory receipt. And then right next to it is a, an identical receipt from the Palmer Hat Company, Paul Liebenau, now it's June 17th, so two days after the fire, and he has now bought, he's had his suit pressed and he's had to buy a new hat uh, because he's got to go to the funeral and mourning bands uh, because of his two uh, dead daughters. So right there on that page, you get the joy of the, you know, the anticipation of this glorious day and then the unspeakable tragedy uh, the next day. Uh, yep, right, side by side. He was quite the kind of chronicler. And Adela, you know, she's 98 years old at this point. She said at one point, she said, I really think this was his therapy. And of course, it's exactly what it was. There was no therapy in 1904. You had to deal with grief on your own in your own way. And so somehow pouring his heart into this, documenting this tragedy became important to him. And you can see it in the fact that he not only cut out things related to the general slocum, but he also cut out poetry. It was kind of popular thing in those days to put poems in uh, you know popular newspapers. And anytime there was a poem that sort of touched on death and loss and sorrow, et cetera, he cut it out and put it in the scrapbook. Um, and there are probably about 20 of them in there, you know, including, you know, the, the, I, there's one, uh, actually, I think it's in the next slide. Yeah. Um, and it's by our standards, Ella Wheeler Wilcox was a very popular poet, um, maybe a little on the sappy side uh, from our perspective in the 21st century, but, um, you know, poems about you know, sorrow, and I, this one sort of commiserating with somebody, saying, I know you've lost, I've lost, life is life is difficult. And then the, a second poem by her, when a baby's so, when a baby's soul sails out, like when a baby dies before it's all, you know, when a baby dies in a tragedy uh, and goes to heaven on its own, it's, you know, spending, going to spend a long, long time on its own until its parents eventually join it. So stuff that really kind of spoke to him as a, as a parent that had, you know, 
experienced such unspeakable uh, loss. The most, one of the most amazing things about the fire, the, this tragedy, and the thing that, one of the things that drew me to it is how for, utterly forgotten it was. It, when I started writing this book in you know 2000, um, almost if you were in a crowd of even New York City aficionados, you know history pe people, and said, "What's the biggest fire in New York City history?" They'd point to this one. They'd say, "Triangle Fire, 1911, 150 or so uh, garment workers died in the in terrible fire." But this fire is one seventh, one seventh as deadly as the Slocum Fire from uh, seven years earlier. Um, so, the, but it has, you know, because of its connection to the labor movement uh, and other parts of the story, it, it gets a little bit more, um, gets a lot more attention. Yeah, this is the, um, and you can see similar scenes, similar photos that remind us of the General Slocum tragedy. Uh, the year, so seven years after the Slocum is the Triangle Fire. One year after that is the sinking of the Titanic. So that, again, a, a epic nautical disaster that kind of, puts the, now the General Slocum tragedy isn't quite, isn't the worst loss of life um, in people's popular imagination. Um, and then World War I, so 1914, so it's just a couple of years after that, 1914, World War I breaks out. And it's almost, it's incredible, the amount of coverage in newspapers that the Slocum tragedy got and the annual commemorations at the cemetery and all got lots and lots of press until World War One, and then it basically disappears from the newspapers because Germans are the evil ones in the American popular imagination. And so it's almost as though Americans say we don't have any more sympathy for the victims of the General Slocum tragedy because they're German and German American. So in the midst of that's one of those things that might have contributed to the forgetting of the tragedy um, in the popular imagination, the demonizing of German Germany and Germans. In the 1920s, um, the Slocum story makes a tiny comeback uh, when James Joyce writes his famous novel, uh, Ulysses. Ulysses is uh, almost a thousand pages and it takes place on a single day, June 16th, 1904 in Dublin. And that's the day after the tr Slocum tragedy. So in the course of this uh, novel, on two occasions, people talk about the General Slocum tragedy, about the terrible fire that happened yesterday. So it 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 gets a little bit of a memory, you know, if any of you know, James Joyce's works are brilliant and amazing and almost, for many folks, unreadable. So I don't know how many people read the, read the Ulysses in the 20s and, and remind, re reminded of the, of the Slocum tragedy. Um, the Slocum tragedy also makes a bit of a comeback in the mid-1930s with this film, Manhattan Melodrama, which is one of your classic, um, you know, um, early Hollywood movies. And it features two uh, two buddies, the two men uh, flanking Myrna Loy there. Uh, they grew up, I think they grew up, oh yeah, so they, they are on the General Slocum. And you can see the the, the still shot on the right-hand side. So the, the movie opens with these young boys on the General Slocum, and then the fire breaks out, and their parents are lost, so they become orphaned. And the long and the short of it is, one of them goes on to become a squeaky clean district attorney, and the other one goes on to become the most fearsome gangster in New York City. And you know, it's a it's a it's a classic movie. Anyway, but the opening scene is this an unbelievable reenactment of the Slocum fire. Uh, I don't think they actually called it Slocum, but it's clearly what they're what they're talking about. They use the Slocum tragedy as a setup device for orphaning these two boys. In also in the 1930s, uh, John Dillinger, uh, the most wanted man in America, the FBI finally catches up with him when he goes to see. A Manhattan melodrama, that movie, and when he steps out of the theater, he's gunned down by the um, by the FBI. Over time, there are commemorative services. So the New York Historical Society has a 50th anniversary exhibition and gathering of survivors, and you can see the people in the photo there are now adults. They're in their 50s and 60s and 70s. These are children that survived uh, the fire. So it doesn't disappear entirely, but it's still pretty small recognition. And then, you know, the, the survivors, the, the family of the survivors and so forth, and the victims, they still show up. They show up here at the 75th uh, anniversary, usually a little ceremony in Tompkins Square Park, also a ceremony out there at the, at the cemetery. The movie Titanic, 1997, um, as Adela will told me, she said my phone rang off the hook for two weeks or three, you know, two months because the 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 sensation that this movie caused caused a lot of you know reporters to sort of write about other tragedies, uh, other nautical tragedies, and so uh, she got a she said a bunch of phone calls about the Slocum tragedy, uh, so it kind of put it a little bit back in in people's memory. Nine eleven also helped the Slocum make a comeback, a little bit of a comeback in people's imagination because. When something like 9-11 happens, they, 
you know, reporters ran around and said, what else compares to this day? You know, the great fire of 1776, the cholera epidemic of 1840, 1849. Um, and then other people pointed to the general slocum. So it, it had a little bit of a, there were stories written about it, but not enough to make it really supplant the, the triangle fire. Um, and then, you know, the last ceremony, the, the final ceremonies, in which Adela was able to attend, she attended, I think, her last one in, when she was 98 years old, 99 years old. Um, but so, and she, when Adela died um, at age 100, she was the last living survivor. So she's the last, she herself didn't actually have a memory of the fire because she was only six months old, but she certainly had the memory of the aftermath and her parents and, and so forth, and living in that shadow of the two deceased sisters. So, when she dies, it becomes it shifts from actual memory to historical memory, um, and in a way, the the the, the hundredth anniversary pl played a big role. Yep, here we go. The hundredth anniversary played a big role in kind of reintroducing people to it because hundredth anniversaries have a way of doing that. I also got the chance to write the book for the hundredth anniversary, so it had a big impact on in terms of getting people to know about it. There were documentaries done about it as well, so it's a little better known, but it still is that kind of strange footnote uh, in New York City history. And with that, I say thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed uh, this presentation. And we do have some time left for questions. So I'm going to uh, close out the, um, yeah, I'm going to unshare. OK, there's one question in the chat. Um... All right. So, um, so did Adela's mother die right away? No, her mother lived. Um, I think until her, her 70s. I think her mother lived um, quite a long ways afterward. And she said she never wanted to talk about the fire. And, and you know, Adela, she didn't even know why her mother was burned on one, one side and not on the other. And she surmised, and it makes total sense. That would have been my guess too, is that she hung on the, over. she got over the railing, hung out over the water. And that was the side that got burned while she kept her baby, you know, out, out, out away from the flames. So it was one of those things that was such an incredible, they they also traveled on that day with, um, I can't remember, with their in-laws, with another young couple with three children as well. And one of the, I think the aunt died and two of the children died. So it was more than just their immediate family, but her mother lived, lived a, a pretty good long life. Her father died uh, relatively young. Um, Getting some praise here. This thing. Have yep. a good presentation. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Um, Do we actually know what started the fire? We don't really know. the The best guess is based on what what, what we learned about how the boat operated, which was that this was the all purpose room where you just kind of went in and found stuff and left stuff, and it had no light. And so, if you walked in, there was a little tin can nailed to the wall with matches. And so you would literally walk into this room with filled with flammables, you know, oily rags, oil lamps, um, straw all over the ground because they had unpacked some glasses the day before. And you'd strike a match and you'd look around and find the item that you were looking for, blow out the match, and then just drop it on the ground. And it's probably that, the, you know, the head of the match didn't quite extinguish. That's the best guess. Or a cigarette, you know, not very common. Cigarettes were becoming increasingly common in those days. So either way, it was a small smoldering fire that, you know, in the same way with the perfect storm, you know, three weather systems coming together to make a spectacular storm. This is sort of three or four factors coming together to make this fire so much more deadly than it than it sh normally would have been. Thank you. Um, Again, Grace, thank you for the next yep. presentation. Somewhere similar to the moral oh, yes. Yeah, so there's a question here. Were there any laws or safety measures created and instituted as a result of the tragedy? You bet. <laughs> that's the that's how it always works. So uh, full-blown investigation. Theodore Roosevelt is president. Um, he prides himself on being, you know, anti-corruption and um, being really against and, you know, and, and a real believer in progressive government and getting things done. So he orders a full cleaning of house of the United States Steamboat Inspection Service fire. They, all kinds of people get fired because it's just it's this giant corrupt nepotism uh, agency that doesn't do much of anything. And so they they clean house, bring in a whole set of new people that are that are qualified. And then they also pass a lot of laws about sprinklers, about, you know, safety measures, about not using flammable paint, um, about having, you know, adequate numbers of lifeboats. And you'll see the same thing uh, after the Titanic. There'll be more, you know, more lifeboats will be added to vessels among other, and the, you won't be allowed, to, after the Titanic, you don't, what happened to the Titanic is um, after about midnight, most of the air boats that were fairly close by turned off their 
radios. And so the Titanic is trying to, you know, sending out distress signals and there are vessels that are not very far away that don't know that it's happening. So that becomes a thing that they correct. So yeah, the, um, the out of the tragedy comes a lot of safety measures, uh, many of which we can see, you know, to this day. Do we have any others? Um, North Brother Island doesn't have anything on it now. They must have needed multiple boats to get the survivors and dead off. Great presentation. Yeah. So North Brother Island today, um, so it was a big contagious disease hospital. So that's what New York did with, New York, lots of cities did this. Anything you, you, was sort of unsavory, like prisons, asylums, and uh, contagious disease hospitals, they put them on the islands. And so this was a big contagious disease uh, hospital. And it, it had closed down, I think, in the 1960s. It's actually where Typhoid Mary uh, spent 27 years of her life after, that's a whole nother story, but when she was found to be a carrier of tuberculosis um, and, you know, vi violated terms of her parole, they put her out there for basically the rest of her life. But um, somewhere in the 1960s, the hospital was closed and then it, you know, decayed, the roof caved in and it became this incredible ghost town of a, of a situation. People would go out there and, you know, steal scrap metal and that sort of thing. But for the most part, it's, it's pretty intact. Over time, it's become an incredible bird reserve. And so I think it's official status now is you're not allowed to go out there for lots of reasons. It's unsafe, uh, but there, but it's also become this incredible bird. I don't know if the proper term is sanctuary, but it, uh, it has a big bird population. And so um, it has a whole new life now. You can do, um, uh, there are lots of documentaries about the, the fire and documentaries, that, quite a bit of film has, has been shot on North Brother Island. So you, if you want to know what it looks like and the kind of spooky, um, scenes of an abandoned hospital that, that is available. You just have to look around on Utah, uh, on uh, YouTube. Um, Any more questions? Um, no, it's only set up here. Um, how long did a survivor live the memory of the disaster? Um, so I think, I mean, I'm not sure about the, um, precisely what the question is, but, you know, anybody that experienced that fire. I mean, let, let me give you another example. Um, so Adela uh, was 98 when I began writing. There was another woman older than her who was like 107, still alive. And she was 11 years old on the vessel. And so she had a vivid memory. She lost her entire family, her mother, her brothers, her father. Um, and I, she was too infirm I think that her, her daughters told me that she was mentally capable, but she was blind and deaf. So it was really essentially impossible to kind of ask her questions. But she had recorded, you know, she had had video interviews done when she was 102, 97. And so I was, and I, somebody gave me those VHSs. And this is a story I heard many times over that many people lived good long lives, patched their lives together and somehow kept going. But when they got much older, you know, when they began to get a little bit more uh, a little bit closer to the to their death, and maybe, and also having a little bit of less control over their their memory and and uh, and their their filters um, and the and the repressed memories that they had repressed for so long that they begin to talk about the fire a lot. Um, and so, with the O'Connell family, uh, her daughter said they she never talked about it, um, or she never wanted to talk about it. And then, you know, the last ten years of her life, she would bring it up all the time. Um, and there's a moment in the video where she's over a hundred years old. She's got her hands on her walker in front of her. She's sitting down telling the story and, she's, and she, closes, she closes her eyes. She says, "If I, when I close my eyes, I can still see the flames. And so the answer is you never lose that memory, no matter how old you are, it's, it's seared into your uh, consciousness. And so some people dealt with it in different ways. There are a lot of stories of, you know, of suicides and alcohol, you know, slow motion suicide, drinking oneself to death among survivors, parents, especially uh, men, especially um, who over the next, you know, five, 10 years died at a young age because it was just too much to bear. So um, I think the, the something like that was just too, too immense to, um, to ever really, uh, to ever really get over. I mean, some people I think managed to, but um, for others, it was a pretty, pretty heavy burden. Um, so the, the, and why don't we, we can make this the last question. Uh, only the captain went to jail, but did anything happen to the company that owned the slogan? Ah, no. <laughs> Rich, here's like a shocker. Rich people have a different justice system, especially 119 years ago. So what they did was, and this is not, you can't do this anymore, but at the time sort of corporate law and corporate liability is really kind of being developed as a legal theory. 
And so what they did was they simply said, uh, first they denied everything. Then they cooked the books, as I talked about. And then they just simply dissolved the company. They just said the Knickerbocker Steamboat Company, I, I don't know exactly what the term is, but they dissolved it as a corporation and then sold at auction the two, the, the, the what was left of the Slocum and the other um, other vessel. And so there was nothing to sue at that point. And so the people were kind of left high and dry and they tried to get some money, some, you know, I don't know what the term would be, so disaster funds from Congress. But again, that was that would happen now in a heartbeat, um, but not back in those days. Uh, they they tried and Congress debated it, but ultimately decided, you know, didn't want to set a precedent. So uh, there was uh, basically, and Frank Barnaby, he, again, was rich in real estate. He died decades later. And I think in his obituary, he died in Bronxville, very wealthy man. Um, I think in his obituary, it didn't mention the general, or it was like one line. He was the owner of the General Slocum, uh, which burned in 1904. It's a very tiny footnote to the overall, um, you know, great career that he had had. All right. Well, uh, it's 8.02, so uh, don't want to overstay my, my, uh, my well, oh, one person, repeat what part of the General Slocum was sold and used again, the hull, sort of the, the, the you know, the, the lower part of the vessel um, was used. And um, if you Google, uh, I think, you know, the famous diver and the actual diver and the guy who wrote, you know, uh, thrillers about diving, Clive Cussler, he just, he found that boat. So somewhere, in, I don't know, 1994 or something, um, he went and found the, 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 the hull of the General Slocum, which at that point had been used as a coal barge. It sank in a storm and he found it. And uh, by, on a whim, I called him. Uh, found his phone number on his website or found an email on his website and called him and he called me back <laughs> and uh, told me the whole story. And then he wrote a nice little, you know, I sent him a copy of the book, the manuscript, and he wrote a nice little blurb on the back of the book. So I got a little, got a little Clive Cussler uh, um, credibility. I don't know exactly where it is. It's just off of, it's off of the coast of New Jersey. And you probably could, if you Googled, you know, General Slocum, Clive Cussler, you might find an article or, or, um, I, I might even mention it in the book, you know, the book is 20 years old, so I can't remember these things, but I might mention sort of it was off of, say, Jersey City or off of some, some. I might give you a slightly better sense of where it was lost. All right. Well, everybody, thank you all very much.